good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where in the world you are and, of course, what time of day or night it is either. Welcome to the podcast Up On The Edge with Al and Owen. I'm your host, Alan Neild, Big Al, or just Al, whatever you want to call me. And each week, I'm going to be joined by regular co-host Owen Sherratt and other special guests along the way too. Right, let's get right into it. This is the podcast Up On The Edge. Just uh, video, mate. Dun, 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 dun. How you doing, mate? Are we all right? I'm okay. I've had a couple of days off, and oh, it's geez, been. What's that like? Well, I've not stopped. <laughs> Have you not? No, mate. I've not stopped. So, it's the same, isn't it? It's always, always something to do. We had. I mean, today I've had a conference for uh, for the mm. day job. Uh, for the fix that screws and um, it was like a full day of a thing you know so it's just like yeah. the day off's gone uh, and then I was doing some editing for this and, and, and now where are you you know what I mean yeah. so it's it's uh, um, yeah. raring to go yeah, it's, it's no don't stop it. you know I was up your neck of the woods uh, Tuesday Wednesday really up in Oldham yeah that's so why I phoned you to um, see if you could help me then you failed miserably so it's alright <laughs> So we ended up going to that station of tools. So did you really? Yeah. So we ended up. Oh, uh, no, we ended God. up in. Um, is there a screw fix where the B and Q is and what have you near Oldham's ground? Uh, not too far from there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think so. End up going there with uh, Mark, the lad who uh, he lives up that neck of the woods. So uh, he's yeah, he's, he's down um, where you come off the M60. Hmm. Yeah, and then, then start. I don't, there's only one there, but I did think that's one she went to. But either ways, well, I, uh, Saturday, I thought well, I'd give my face a bit of a trim and uh, I trimmed you, you, all my beard, lovely. You look and sexy. then I got, I got the shark bit and I just trimmed it like that. And then uh, I took a chunk off. I thought I have to shave <laughs> the bloody thing off now. So, <laughs> oh, gutted. Hence the youthful look. Hence the youth. Well, you, you, you do look about 48 rather than, uh, oh, hello, uh, hello, rather than 57. You know what I mean? <laughs> 57, God. Eh? I hope my lucky 48. Not, still not three years after <laughs> Talking of a young hey! chap there, see you. Good evening, Ian. You all right, mate? I'm not so bad. How are you doing? I'm all right. Nice like to meet you. This is Al, by the way, Ian. How do you do? Nice to see you. All right, dude. Are we yeah, well? Yeah, not yeah, all right, thank you. That's quite a collection of guitars you've got floating around behind you there. You want to see the staircase, mate, downstairs. It's ridiculous. The wife yes. hates me. I, I used to do it with motorbikes, and I don't know if I've ever told you this, Owen, but I was no. really, really good at, at, at buying motorbikes and shit at selling them, and I'm exactly the same with bass guitars, <laughs> Yeah, it's, oh, it's just the way terrible. the cookie crumbles, I'm afraid. Yeah. So how yeah. are you keeping it, you? I'm all right, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've got, I've only got three guitars, uh, and I get zero time to play on them at all, just because I'm running around like a blue ass fly, being a dad and running a TV show. So yeah, they just sort of yeah. just in the corner at the minute. So you, see, you, you've hooked my attention that bedroom right the top, away. Are they? What what have you got, Ian? What what what's what's hanging on your what, walls? What have I got? I've got uh, the the best of them is. Uh, uh, reproduction it's a Gibson ES335 reproduction of the 1963 one it's very nice yeah. um, and uh, unfortunately uh, because I'm not allowed to have all my gear lying around it sort of resides in the top room of the house and doesn't get played a lot but the thing that gets played the most is uh, I don't know if you'll remember this brand but they've got yeah. bought by Gibson as well but it's an acoustic brand called Garrison they're a Canadian acoustic guitar brand no. um, and their USP was instead of having a wooden skeleton inside the hollow body they've got a fiberglass one so they you can they weigh nothing but they sound really massive so i play that wow. a bit and then because when i was in my teens uh, i thought i was going to be a heavy metal shred master yeah uh, i've got an I, I, ibanez rg750 floating around as well with one of those wafer thin necks on it um wow. so that that was my uh, weapon of choice for many years when i thought i was going to be the next steve Vai, and then it turns out yeah. i wasn't so uh so did you have the lycra though 
<laughs> yeah, oh, well. <laughs> I do, but not for the guitar playing. That's just for my, that's just for my personal life. And, you know, the, the first gig I ever took, I have twin girls in, and um, the, the 25 year old now, but the first gig I ever took them to, probably 15 years ago, was at the, uh, the arena in Manchester. And it was uh, working in, in radio, you just sort of got tickets for everything. You, you know, you'll know this. Um, and it was the darkness of all people oh, you know, yeah. which great band live I'm, you know you, you can't take anything away from them um, but the band fired up and then all of a sudden just is he called Justin Hawkins yeah. yeah yeah Justin Hawkins comes out from the back of the stage and sort of glides over the top of the crowd on a giant pair of tits <laughs> and the, the twin girls must have been about 10 or 11 year old at this point in time you know and it was like oh god dad what's yeah. he riding on uh, let's stand over in the mother. corner yeah, yeah. 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 so yeah. as you said Ian you, you run a TV programme now it's not the first TV programme you've done um, for those that don't know Ian or, or haven't heard of Ian where have you been for starters second thing is Ian is currently running Coronation Street Oh wow! So um, now, I, I, I met Ian a few years ago, um, and he was a writer. We got chatting. Um, you started your career from radio, if I remember rightly. I did indeed. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rock FM, which is we'd had Rob Charles on uh, a couple of weeks ago. We did, yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah he's, the he's, 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 chair. Yeah, that's that is the one that was mentioned as well. Uh, but you started there as a creative writer, didn't it? so how did you get from there to TV? Uh, just by blind luck, really. I mean, I, I used to be a radio producer, which you guys will know. It sounds fancy, but really, you're just the fella that makes the tea and comes up with the stupid, <laughs> not, the stupid nonsense that you're going to talk about on the air for that day. So I started off doing that and um, used to sort of make up stupid little skits and sketches and sort of you know little comedy bits for the radio. And then, um, as you will also know, having worked on the radio, it doesn't exactly pay that well. And uh, I used to... You know, occasionally be getting like a taxi to the radio station at like four in the morning to go and do the breakfast show and the cabbie would get to the bottom of what I did for a job and would be like, oh, blimey, so you must be doing all right then. I'm like, no, it's no. not really. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? I'm, not, uh, I'm not Chris Moyles, you know, I've just, so you, you don't get paid an awful lot. And it got to a point where I was like, well, getting up at 3.30 in the morning, you sort of feel like I wanted a bit, a bit, firstly, a bit of a normal life back where you're getting up at a sensible time, but also sort of felt like radio is the best job in the world if it paid better. So I thought, you know, I'm not, not all about the money, but I thought, let's apply for a few jobs in television, uh, sent my CVs off to a few people and uh, was massively underqualified, but was just lucky enough to the, the CV landed on the right guy's desk and he got me in for a chat and uh, made me a, a part-time researcher on, uh, on Coronation Street, which was my first ever gig actually back in the day. And so that what you're basically doing is all the storylines that they want to tell. You have to go away and work out whether they're, you know, how to make them plausible, I guess. And you yeah, might argue viable. that we didn't, yeah. didn't always pull it off. But, um, but yeah, you sort of become a pub quiz genius because you're there <laughs> looking into like diseases and like what happens when you get arrested for nicking a car and how do you hotwire a car and, you know, <laughs> what's the best way to go about poisoning somebody without getting caught by the police. So my Google search history was an absolute nightmare. If anyone had ever looked at my laptop, I'd be going straight to prison because you're just Googling all kinds of terrible things. But um, And then, yeah, got my foot in the door there and just sort of worked my way up and around the place. And here I am. Yeah. So, because, of course, you've worked on Emmerdale as well and Hollyoaks. Now, yeah. now for me, obviously, we're knowing you as well. I've, I've kind of followed your career to a degree. And I've noticed everywhere you go, you seem to win awards. What's all that about? Uh, just blind luck, really, uh, I think, yeah. I mean, they've, they've dried up a bit since I've got to Curry, which is nobody's fault, really, but it's just the way the cookie crumbles. But, yeah, I was very lucky to work with a lot of very talented people, and I guess it's uh, it's about backing the right horse at the right time. So, you, you know, I'd love to claim the credit for all the, the silverware that we won, but I just happened to arrive when the shows were approaching the crest of a wave, and I happily surfed it all the way to the BAFTAs and beyond and then moved on and the same thing happened. So, you know, a, bit, a mixture of luck and hard work, I guess, like with anything in life. How long yeah. have you been down at Coronation Street now then, Ian? Uh, I started there in May 2018, so it's been a little while now. But um, if you add it, I added this up the other day, which is, it's, it's a bit like working out how old you are. It's a bit depressing, but I worked out the other day that if you uh, count up all the episodes of Coronation Street that I've ever worked on, 
it amounts to something like one fifth of their total output ever from 1960. I've done something like 2,000 episodes or something like that. Wow. Really. So, yeah. You've seen it all, by You know, people say yeah. there's, only, there's only seven stories in existence. Well, I've probably told all of them about 106 times each by now. But anyway, hopefully, <laughs> no one noticed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's the thing. But do you find, um, obviously, you're, you're in a position now where, uh, yo, know, do you get headhunted still? Are you, are you still swayed or do people still come in and ask you things? Or uh, They do and they don't. I mean, it, it's a funny thing with uh, with soap. It's a very sort of so peculiar job. So uh, it, there's a bit of snobbery around it, if I'm honest. You know, yeah. people who do 9 p.m. dramas and, and all those Netflix shows, which these days everybody's watching, including me, and they're great. They're really, really good. But you know, we get four, five, six times as many viewers as them. And yet I think people tend to look at soap with a bit of a, you know, they look down the nose at it a little bit. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's not, it's not like I've got sort of uh, HBO knocking on my door going, come to the US and make the next hit. Put Game of Thrones happen. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've got to be honest with you. I'm one of those guys because um, it's just it's sort of uncool I think for a guy to be into soaps uh, yet I know quite a few of the guys down, down where you are and uh, I, I'm, I have the joy of living with uh, my wife and, and twin daughters so I've got no choice I've got to watch it if I want to watch the TV I am watching Coronation yeah. Street you know uh, up to five nights a week uh, yeah, twice yeah, a yeah, night not, yeah yeah there's a lot of it isn't there oh yeah. man it's uh, it, it's very full on I had the privilege the, the company that I, I do the day job for um, is just around the corner from you uh, from, from where um, the studios are it's on Regent yeah. Road uh, oh, yeah. I'll say it, it's screw fix there you go oh, and yeah. so the, the new set a lot of the products that was used to build the new set uh, the guys from the set building team used to come in all the time and then it got to the stage where they were phoning me up and saying, Al, is there any chance you can drop this and that off for me? And then I was there sort of two times a day, three times a day, and it just got ridiculous. Those guys never, ever stop, do they? Oh, it's incredible. It is incredible. And it's been doubly hard for them, the whole pandemic situation, because, you know, there's a lot of kit that needs lugging around and assembling and all, you know, just physically putting the set together and trying to do that and stay two metres away from each other all the time. They, yeah, they, they, yeah. yeah, people put a shift in. Um, especially now, you know, as you say, we do six episodes a week now, so it's like the equivalent of a, a motion pictures work of television we do in a, in a week. Um, so they, they, yeah, they're grafters. There's not a, there's not a man jack of them that isn't a proper grafter in that place, and the show would fall off the air if they weren't. So thank God for them. Yeah. Really. And one yeah. of the things that uh, I was sort of secret, I was let into, um, and I don't, I don't know whether this is common knowledge or not, but um, the street that's at the back of, or one of the, the streets that's come off Coronation Street, I don't know the name of it, uh, but there's a couple of old shops on there, and mm -hmm. uh, one of them's named after the headset builder. Is that right? I think that might be right. Do you know, I, I, this isn't a story that I know, but that does ring a bell, yeah. It's, um, I think it's Maudsley Street, it's called, and there's like a, there's an old engineering frontage there that's and then there right. might be a, like a pawn broker next to it or something I think and um, yeah I think they probably were named after four, yeah. either former or current members of staff yeah, yeah. we do a lot of that we, we, we snuck in uh, during the 60th there was a big bulldozer turned up to knock some houses down and we have obviously you can't use real company names when you're on, on the television so you have to make yeah. them up and um, it was named after the it was Elton Latham Construction or something and it was named after the first ever producer and the commissioning editor that first commissioned the show or something like that and yeah. Yeah. lots of little bits like that where we, we we sneak things in that we some of our like hardcore fans will go oh yeah I spotted that yeah, yeah but, so yeah. there's no no sort of real intended product placement then well no there is these days but it has to be done by the book there's a, there's a we've, we've got a woman uh, who, who works across both ITV soaps so at Emmerdale and Coronation Street I think and her job is just to sell product placement but it's incredibly hard to get it on the telly because mm -hmm. the rules are stuff like you can see it but it can't be too prominent so you can't do that American thing where you're sort of like mm, <laughs> this is wrong for you. Uh, so it has to sort of appear in the background you can't yeah. source it in the so actually it's quite hard to sort out you know at the minute we've got a, a Costa coffee shop down the one end of the street and yeah. we've got a co-op um, and uh, obviously we're now, we, we were sponsored by a bunch of meerkats and now we're sponsored by Argos recently. But yeah, there's it's, it's not a lot of it, thank goodness, because I think it's difficult. I, understandably, our actors are, you know, sometimes 
a bit like, oh, I don't want to turn into some kind of salesman. I'm an actor. So, you know, yeah, yeah. generally we try and keep it subtle because let's face it, the viewers don't want to see us trying to force product. The only products they really want, and people ring us up and go, where can I get hold of Betty's Hot Pot? And we're like, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't, exist. It doesn't exist anymore. It did exist no. in, the, some, in the 70s. Somebody licensed the name for Betty's Hot Pot. Yeah, Holland's. Wow. Yeah, it, did they did do it, it, it for a while. Yeah, Holmes yeah. did it for a while. Yeah, so wow. uh, that's going back a bit. That's when you could put um, all sorts of additives in, in stuff you bought yes. from the shops. Yeah, you and know, do that the good old days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the good old days. So, where so, did it all start for you, then, Ian? I know you talked about radio and one thing or another. Was it something? Did you sort of wake up one morning and think, do you know what? I really want to be in the glitz and glamour and and that kind of lifestyle. And and radio sounds really good. Yeah, but, uh, well, basically, I, uh, yes, I think is the short answer to that. I started off as a radio journalist, so I was the guy that sort of uh, arrived at the top of the hour and went, it's 9 p.m., mind me in the cloud, doing the whole, you know, <laughs> the news just in. And uh, yeah, so I started off doing that, but that was stressful, to be honest. Yeah, and uh, I remember a couple of it, the worst, the worst time I had when I was being a radio newsreader was um, I got the hiccups shortly before going on air. <laughs> and it was like, I, and I could see the little pips counting down and I was about to go on air and I started with the hiccups. And then I, I thought, oh God, this is going to be like an absolute murder. And um, basically looked at the first story and it was a really serious story. And it was, you know, and I was like, Oh, and I wanted to corpse because I was hiccuping, but it was like this horrible, serious story about you know um, uh, doctors in Warrington, and I was like, oh no! And then I sort of took the turned over to the next page and was thinking, please let it be a funny story because when we get to a funny story, I can laugh with the presenter. Yeah. And I turned over the page and it was like the actor Dudley Moore has died, aged eighty-six, <laughs> in home in Los Angeles. And I was like, oh no. And, was, and I was working my way down the bulletin and every single story was just a, this really sad story and I was just dying to laugh throughout the whole thing and then finally I got to the weather and then the DJ faded up his fader and he was just killing himself laughing and I was like yeah. well it's alright for you to laugh mate I've just soldiered through like six minutes of torture <laughs> and so I sort of decided then that maybe I wasn't cut out to be a radio newsreader far too stressful and then decided it looks much more fun doing the, the presenter's stuff you know I want to I want to be messing about and getting paid for it, really. So then yeah. I quickly changed horses and did a bit of that, really. So, yeah. Do you not miss being on air at all, then? Oh, all the time. Honestly, I would tell you now, you know, if radio paid better, I'd be doing it to this day. It's the best job ever, you know. On a good day, yeah. it's like you turn up, everyone's just firing on all cylinders. You're messing about with your mates. Like, you get some comedy gold caller rings up with some nonsense, and it's just you know four hour um, show flies by and you sort of think my god it's five to ten how do we get here it's just the, it is the best gig in the world really but uh, mm. as I say the 3am starts wore a bit thin pretty quickly yeah. and, and certainly back in those right. days commercial radio was like um you know, you could have made more sort of uh, flogging hot dogs outside the football stand, frankly. So, yeah. um, you know, and as I say, I'm not all about the money. I did radio for a long, long time. But in the end, you sort of think, you know, it, wouldn't it be nice to actually own a house? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, even, to, yeah. Yeah. Get around in and things like that. Because there is, I mean, the sound got on, the money's got tighter and tighter in radio, uh, yeah, especially with networking and stuff like that. So, because uh, yeah. obviously myself and I at the Revolution, they sold that, the station just for not as a station but they had to buy the complete station name and the airwaves just for the airwaves yeah. so yeah. But that's just the way it's gone and it's this few and few radio jobs yeah, yeah it was heading that way when I left really and it was you sort of mm. see all these specialist shows like the sort of late night dance shows and stuff just sort of dropping away and you sort of see your mates yeah. coming out of the program controller's office looking white white as a sheet and you're like what and they're like well they're networking my show so I'm gone and it's just it's yeah. starting yeah. to happen and it, you know that did figure in my decision a little bit sort of like yeah, well yeah. It, 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 I didn't want to feel like a rat deserting a sinking ship or anything but I did sort of see the writing on the wall sadly mm. and I miss local radio you know it's not you know obviously the national radio stations are what they are but local radio is fantastic and I, I, it's a shame that it's all getting centralised in networks there's nothing but, like local radio you know when you get to broadcast to a certain area where you know the people the people know you and you're getting the regular calls and the regular text messages it is just the business there's nothing like it anywhere yeah I completely agree yeah we used to have a right bunch of uh, regular calls that were uh, ec eccentric to say the least and I do I miss them I've got all the sort of tapes of the, the show upstairs 
yeah. uh, which I should occasionally dig out and listen back and go, oh yeah, there was Janet from Bolton that used to ring up about a corned beef hash all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get that yeah. Did you, you know, get an alcoholic? No. Oh yeah. 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 Regularly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ian, Ian the alcoholic used to ring me all the time, and I used to get a girl, uh, oh, oh, a woman that would send me, uh, email me, a photograph of a different part of her body uh, every night of the week. Uh, so it was like a collage, and I had to put it together, and, and she was naked. Um, you know, so there's this weird things like that would happen, and it was just, <laughs> the, just the most ridiculous thing on the planet. Crazy. Well, uh, so, yeah, thankfully, uh, we missed the gory details of that there because he froze. But I can picture. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, TV is it's a completely different medium because uh, I find radio more of a personal medium than TV because you've got to sit and watch it. Whereas with radio, it's it's just on the background. But uh, with the TV, is there any particular people? That you just I'm going to take it. You deal with some of the actors as well as the writers. Oh yeah, all the time. Uh, yeah. And. Do you get a lot of input from the actors as to what they'd like you to do or what you'd like to put in or things to say? Or? It depends who they are, really, yeah. I mean, some of them like to come up and have lengthy chats about their character and about their story and, you know, the classic sort of what's my motivation kind of chat. And yeah. some of them just like, listen, mate, you, you hand me the script and I'll read it and I'll take home the money and, I, you know, whatever happens in the middle is up to you. Uh, so it depends, you know, and, and you know, it, it's a nice industry to work in. I know classically everyone thinks TV is a bit backstabbing. And I'm sure that is true in some places, but certainly on the shows I've worked on, everybody's been incredibly nice. And because it's, it's all been soap for me, really. And, and like, yeah. as you pointed out with your pals from the uh, construction shop, they work so hard. And if you don't get on, or you've got, a, you know, a bad apple or somebody creating a bad atmosphere, they, they don't really last very long because you just can't. You can't work at that speed and make yeah. that much TV if everyone's not pulling in the same direction. Yeah. So yeah, they do come up though, and they'll, you know, um, the, the tension for me is like I have to sort of mediate between the writers who are, you know, classically writers are creative types and they're very passionate about what they do and passionate about the words they've written, and then the actors are very creative types and they're passionate about what they do. And sometimes you'll get stuck in the middle when an actor's like, "I'm just not saying that line. I hate it. I'm not doing it. You can't make me say it." I dare Did you. Actually, come on. Has that happened? It does happen occasionally, yeah. And, you know, more often than not, it's coming from a really valid place. It's just like, yeah. you know, but so, sometimes, and you know, it's very rare, occasionally an actor will come up and you think they just don't want to say it because it maybe doesn't make them look very good or they're worried that somebody in the supermarket will go, hey, I saw you on the telly the other night saying this. <laughs> or, you know, so, so some of yeah. them worry about how it's going to make them look. Yeah. Um, but by and large, it comes from a good place, I think. Yeah, so I you know years ago um, when I lived in Toronto, I used to have a pint with um, uh, what's his name? I'm Dingy Kennedy. Uh, oh, Kevin, Kevin. Oh, Kevin. Yeah, Kevin Kennedy, yeah. And uh, he was brilliant with old people and with kids. Everyone else, he'd say hello to. He was never rude to him, but he didn't seem to have that much time for him. But kids, I remember going yeah. in one day with my daughter. He was there for ages. I was waiting to get home to finish dinner off and uh, she used to go for a walk around the air. And I'm going, come on, it'd be burning, you know. And, uh, yeah, and yeah, she was yeah. just happily just sat there chatting away. But he took and sat down. And and again, uh, he was brilliant with the old people as well. Uh, and the, the guy who plays Peter Barlow. I mean, yeah, I was talking to him one night. I didn't realise it was him at first. And uh, I just got talking to him. And then it, when it twigged, Oh, sorry, mate. I bet you think I'm either than you. And he goes, "No, no, no. It's all right. It's, it's nice to have a normal conversation because you're surprised how many people think I really am, Peter Barlow. You know, yeah. and, yeah, and I think really at the time do. it just dumped that shelly. So yeah, it's, getting a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, I, I, it's funny, isn't it? Because like, it tends to be like if you were in a if you're in Pizza Hut or whatever, and you look over and there's Tom Cruise, you'd probably go. <gasps> Yeah, it's Tom Cruise over there, and you, you just go, "Don't look, don't look." You're probably he's probably just trying to be quiet and dinner. Just leave him alone. But when it's a soap actor, everyone's like, "Oh my god!" And they and they run over and like, oh, still and they're sitting on your knee, and you're just you know, just trying to have a, like a quiet meal with your missus, and then suddenly you've got like five people asking you selfies, and they get it all the time. It's it must be hard for them to be honest. It's yeah. like, I think to a certain extent, though. I think if you go for that kind of job to a certain extent, you sort of subscribe to that, don't you? You know, you've no way around it. It's going to happen. I guess, I guess so, but you don't know that's what it's going to be like till you're in and then it's too late, really. I think that's that's the trouble. I mean, I, I can genuinely tell you now that um, I can't really think of a single one of our actors that's in there for the fame. Like, most of our actors do just want to turn up, do the job, and then get the hell out of there and go home. Yeah. Um, they're not. They're not really 
strange as it might sound, showbiz types with a lot of them. They, they, yeah. they want to go back to the garden and sort of dig the allotment over. That's really what they want. And it's, it's tough because, again, you're an ambassador for the show and, and you only have to be rude to one person now in this social media age. Yeah, and then yeah. suddenly it's all over Twitter that, oh, do you know who was a right ass when I met him the other day? This guy. And, uh, you know, so you have to kind of be on your best behavior all the time. Otherwise, somebody's going to bang it on social media that you're not a very nice person. So there's a lot of pressure on it, I think. But and so, I, I suppose they can quit, but, you know, it's uh, it's, their, it's their living, isn't it? It's their living, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course it is. One of the things I did notice um, when I was sort of dropping products off down at your place, uh, you tend to get a lot of fans gathering outside the entrance of the studio. Does that still happen? Uh, yes, it does. Um, not during the pandemic, I should say. Actually, nowadays, now I think of it, but um, the eight, it's because it, it's a bit further afield. You don't get so many. When we're at Key Street in the centre of town, yeah, there'd usually be twenty, thirty people waiting around the gates with little autograph pads or whatever. Um, but nowadays, it's probably a much smaller, more dedicated, hardcore of fans that, that go down there. But yeah, there's, there's some people that travel from out of town and come down and sort of, uh, and they're generally, yeah. you know, they. It, it just reminds you of how much of a massive deal it is working on yeah, Coronation yeah. Street because there's people there going, oh, 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 it's, it's this guy, it's that guy. And you think, oh, yeah, you know, we're in seven, eight million people's homes every night. You know, just, uh, it's a bit, it's good. It reminds you that, you know, there's people out there that really love what you do and it reminds you not to mess it up, really. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It. See, I've got to admit, the good thing, um, both with, or what I find with both Coronation Street and with Emmerdale, um, I only used to watch Ellie Oaks from time to time. Um, uh, the, it's the comedy value because, I mean, some yeah. of the lines that um, Steve, Steve McDonald comes out with, I mean... He's genius, it, isn't it? It's one of them. I mean, and I can imagine being like that in real life and you just want to go for a pint with him, wouldn't you? Yeah. But yeah. He's, the, the comedy, the same in with uh, Marlon and uh, Paddy, them pair, they were just comedy gold. Yeah, and, and they, uh, they, I can tell you now officially those three fellas are both salt, all three salt of the earth and all three very funny in real life as well so, yeah yeah I mean a lot of the comedy obviously comes from the writers in terms of the words that are put in their mouth but they've, they've just got funny bones those three fellas they're really yeah, and yeah. they're sound lads as well you know mm. I do I do miss uh, a lot of the people I've worked with on the other shows I have to say but you know yeah yeah Curry first they're my family but um, but yeah you know, so um, what, what are we doing is that? I wouldn't put you in a position where we would ask you to uh, discuss your least favourite uh, actor while you were in TV. We'll do that later. You'd never. You'd have to put the thumb screws on for me to even think about that. <laughs> More than my life is worth. Who's the absolute gem? Who's the person that's head and shoulders just stands above everybody else? You know, salt of the earth, down to earth, do anything for you, heart on the sleeve. Who's it going to be? Um, well, that's a tricky question, isn't it? It could still get me in trouble. Um, so I'll pick somebody that nobody could possibly argue with. Uh, but my, my wife's over there going, don't tell them, don't tell them. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> Benity, let him tell us. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know whether it's possible to say there's one over all the others, but the name that popped into my head was Bill Tarmy, who used to play uh, Jack Duckworth, who was just down to yeah. earth, funny as, incredibly professional, um, everybody loved him, you know, sorely missed by everybody connected to the show. And I think that would be an uncontroversial choice, really. That was the yeah. first name that popped into my head. But there's loads, honestly, it's, as I say, it's, you, you tend to hear that, oh, TV's full of divas and all the rest of it. And it really isn't, honestly. At least it, if they are, they're hiding it very well when I see it. So, yeah, you know, it, it's, an, it's, it's a nice crowd. Well, I think in what yeah. you've just said, you've actually, um, one of one of our big uh, followers, listeners, watchers, whatever you want to call them, uh, with podcast, uh, he was good friends, ironically enough, with Bill Tarmy. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 Tony Dino, yeah. Yeah, Tony Corrigan. He's very good friends. Um, yeah. You know, they used to go drinking together, and, and one thing, there were lots of photographs of, of the pair of them knocking about together. Um, and I think he will, you've just put a big smile on his face. Definitely. Oh, good. Well, yeah, yeah. Bill's so. got a lot of smiles on a lot of people's faces, so it's only fair that I... Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and forward. the funny thing is, my mum used to nurse his mum. Ah, yeah, my really? mum's a district nurse, yeah, yeah. So, it and she was saying... It's a pretty small world, isn't it? As they, yeah, yeah. Say. But saying Bill used to always send chocolates and flowers for all the nurses that have been... He was smashing like that. So. Yeah, sounds about but, right, yeah. So is there any sort of TV that you, you, know, you think, yeah, I could do that a little bit better? Like, for me, that dinner date... You know where you, you pick the five menus, you pick three, uh, and then you invite them round and you cook for them. Now, for me, it's all wrong that. What we should do is whoever's going on the date, so state it's a girl and she's got to pick the three menus, I'd let her parents 
pick the menus and then go for the meal and then choose the day you're, yeah you're right you know that makes a lot more sense it'd be way more interesting because how yeah, many what, times obviously apart from your wife now Ian how many times your parents go no good for you uh, no good for you but if they could pick it out right then it just cuts out the middle man I don't think like it yeah sorted with <laughs> dad's, right. dad's never say that it's only ever the mums that say that no no yeah oh he's a lovely lad I don't yeah. know why you let him go yeah but uh, <laughs> yeah, so no, no, done. surely somebody's got to do a dating show where the parents pick the pick the partner that's that's a peach I, of an idea that I don't well maybe we should pitch this then Ian we should sit down and it. put it together there yeah, you go. It sells itself, that does. I, I love that. I if think you yeah. could set a up for us, that would be fantastic. Have we frozen again? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think I could do better. Um, Oh, tricky. I don't really sit around thinking about that too often because my brain's too fried. But um, I've got a good idea of how to improve naked attraction, which is maybe just have them leave their clothes on. There's a thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'd be, yeah. Just, you know, I've got one there. Yeah, it's one of the programs, isn't it? You, it's, uh, just, yeah. But uh, yeah, apart from that, no, I think, you know, because I think because you know how hard it is to make TV, um, it's, I'm very reluctant to sort of stick the boot in on other people's because it's like, mm. I know that might not be to my taste, but they sweated over that for two years to get to that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. See, but, um, see yeah, for so me, with my line of work, when it looked, for one of the biggest things, the best example for this is uh, Life on Mars. Oh, yeah. And they were in somebody's backyard. And of course, it was set in 73. And on the wall is a valent flu. And I'm going, well, that ball didn't come out till 1983. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I know it's tough. And I think, but little things like that, do you ever spot stuff on the TV and you're thinking, that's just not right? All the time. Sometimes I spot it in the shows that I'm working on. I'm like, oh, we've missed that. Uh, but yeah. yeah, those kinds of things. I love it when you see like a costume drama and there's some guy in like a big ruffled shirt and a top hat and giving it the whole Victorian routine. And you can like see a, a burglar alarm on the on the house behind you. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Somebody's not. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or a digital watch. <laughs> exactly that, yeah. yeah. I remember. Classic one, in, classic one in Game of Thrones, wasn't there, when there was that big dramatic scene and somebody had left like a, a Starbucks cup in the, on, on the table in the middle of the shop. <laughs> really? Like, oh. So yeah, somebody's getting fired over that. I actually remember when, when Coronation Street was moving from uh, Key Street over to where it is now when I was talking to... Um, uh, oh, what's he called? Kieran Hatsar. I don't know if Kieran's yeah. still there. Yeah. He's indeed, and, yeah. And and Kieran was saying what, what they were doing is they was actually widening Coronation Street as well so they could get cars up and down it rather than yeah. the old one where you could only just get one down. And he said they had to take lots and lots of photographs of the old set so they could perfectly replicate it because the amount of people that would be phoning up and going, hang on a minute, that's not right. It used to be like this, and and it could be a blade of grass or some moss in the um, uh, in the the, the cement Gutters, between the brickwork yeah. on the wall and things like that. You know. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, they would. I mean, even down to um, the character Dennis Tanner, I think it was in 1961, wow. uh, scratched a bit of graffiti on the front of one of the terraced houses, and that's yeah. been recreated down to the tiniest little millimeter. It's still there. Oh yeah, yeah, still there. Um, but you're right when you say the street got made bigger and the, it, it used to just be two third size which you wouldn't really see on the telly but when yeah. you walk down it it did feel very small and mm. the biggest problems we had were things like you know classically uh, the rover's return always catches fire every five years or so and there's like a big you know like a big stunt <laughs> yeah. where who's going to die in the fire and whenever you used to do that at the old place you couldn't get a fire engine down the street and it certainly couldn't come around the corner and even if you got it there it was the fire engine made the houses look like they were lego houses because the fire engine was up to the kind of roof line of the houses so it was dead dead small and it's it's much much more usable now but i also think when they were remaking it they had to because the materials they were using they wanted to use exactly the same materials yeah and i think they had to go back to some quarry in china or somewhere where they'd originally got the cobblestones from or the slates for the roofs or something and they had to go back on this kind of historical detective hunt to find the exact same quarry and get the exact same stones so that so that when they remade these houses and the street and the pavements and everything it looked exactly the same so there was yeah literally no stone stone left unturned when they did it see there again you've got another great idea for a mini documentary 
Yeah. Absolutely. Rebuilding yeah. Coronation Street. Yeah. So, Unfortunately, so, we would have to knock it down first in order to rebuild it. <laughs> <laughs> it only takes one tram. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing is, do the Barlow's ever get fed up with people going in their back gardens to use the toilet, the Rovers? Ah, uh, good question. Uh, apparently, uh, there's, there also used to be a function room upstairs at the Rovers, some of you may remember, but uh, yeah, this, they used to go upstairs and there'd, there'd be this massive sort of working men's club size <laughs> room up there, which is gone. Uh, but yeah, don't, don't, don't think too hard about the geography of any of those sets because none of it makes sense. There's loads of houses where if you sit down and go, hang on, man, it's a two up, two down, we've got this character and this character and this character and then ma'am and their boyfriend and then you, you think where are all these people sleeping they must be in, yeah. you know must be out in the yard um, yeah but when so it yeah, first come on the screens time. when it first come on the screens people lived like that no, them, didn't they? oh yeah yeah, they did. you know, yeah absolutely babies yeah, in the bottom houses, drawer and... yeah yeah a lot of yeah. the houses have still got the old um, outhouses in the backyard as well although you know people only use them now to like hide uh, firearms or illegal mobile <laughs> but, but allegedly nobody, allegedly, allegedly. Yeah. 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 Nobody, <laughs> that's, that's in the fiction that's not actually members of ah, right. okay. yeah. <laughs> ironically yeah. enough you know the um, the original set was based um, I believe on a, a street in Salford and uh, my auntie used to live on it and she had an outside loo and I remember as a kid going to the outside loo and, and the job was if you went to the toilet you took a newspaper with you to rip uh, into to sheets so that if you ever yeah, got caught out, on the nail. Yeah. Oh, no bathroom good. inside it was all outside yeah yeah I actually weird, I forget the name of the street now um, but I drove up there the other day just because I was uh, driving along Regent Road and I thought oh, I'm just going to pull off and have a little look at, uh, again and drive up there and it's uh Still looks much the same as the original opening credits, really. Yeah, so, yeah. Not changed yeah. a great deal. Like a lot of sulfur doesn't change a great deal, I suppose. But yeah, yeah on yeah. Sulfur, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's, it's still sort of the earth people. Still really great people down there. You know, yeah, well, yeah. I I, um, I lived just off Regent Road for two or three years, so I have some uh, experience with that. And yeah, you're, you're dead right. It's uh, you know, it's it's the sort of community that everyone thought didn't exist anymore until the pandemic happened and everyone yeah. decided we needed communities again but prior yeah. to that yeah. everyone thought yeah. community was gone but it's, it's not really in those parts of Salford I have to say I haven't been there so, so we, we, yeah. listen, we've got about five minutes left before this um, lovely uh, platform kicks us off I just wanted to say um, what about going forward for you now <laughs> is it is it Coronation Street all the way or have you got plans for the future or you know what's going to happen in your world Oh, good question. Uh, I mean, I'm in mean, absolutely no hurry to leave Coronation Street. I think um, last year was, um, for the whole planet, was an, a nightmare. And whatever plans you might have had, whatever you do for a job or whatever you do away from your job, everything went in the bin. So I still feel like I've got lots of ideas to, to do that I wasn't able to do last year because of the, the way we had to film. So um, I'm, I'm intending to recreate all the genius that I was going to do last year and do it for the next 12 months, at, at least if I've got my way about it. But yeah. And beyond that, I don't know really. I, you know, my 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 heart is definitely in television and UK television, and and you know, I, what I love most about Corrie is the kind of comedy side of it, which you've mentioned before. And so, doing something comical would be good. But um, yeah, I, I'm classically bad at having a five year plan. You know, you see in, in job interviews, people say, "What's your five year plan?" I'm like, oh, I actually knew you were going to ask me this. And still <laughs> yeah, yeah. I still didn't plan in advance and think of something to say. So if I can't yeah. think five minutes ahead for a job interview, I've got no idea what I'm doing five years ahead, if I'm honest with you. But as, you know, as long as I'm making television, I'll be happy. And what about, uh, right, have we got a walk on part sorted out for uh, two fat lads that used to be in radio once over? Why well, do you know me? <laughs> yeah. Suddenly it's off. easy. <laughs> yeah, I'm not fat, just big bone, my mum told me. <laughs> Is this on your dating show application that she was doing? Right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> probably, yeah. No, uh, yeah, we'll sort oh, that, man. no bother, yeah. You know, if we need some... Uh, if we need some, uh, what's the word, uh, jovial radio type. We do have actually a fictional radio station in the show called Webby FM. So uh, if we're ever needing a kind of guest presenter or two, then I know where to come, don't I? You do indeed, yeah. Super. I even bring me old headphones. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Ian, we've nah, come to know. that time. We're going to have to draw a line on this, I'm afraid. That is just about the quickest 35, 40 minutes of my life. It was brilliant. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we, fingers crossed, we'll get you back on again in the next maybe six months or so and, and uh, get some updates off you. Any any time, lads. Honestly, it's been a pleasure. Ian, Ian. thanks a lot, mate. Love to the family and... Uh, I'll speak to you very soon. You will. Thank you, gents. And, Take uh, care. Yeah, uh, I'll speak to you soon. Thanks a All lot. All the best, mate. Bye. Yeah. Bye.